what really was instrumental in us understanding this was the results of the computation. You know, it's experimentally, it's just very, very difficult to get some of those diagnostics. So if you develop some confidence in these models, then it allows you to kind of extrapolate and say, what if? You know, what if I had something like this? Or what if I had something like, like that? And of course, then you can make some, some predictions. Military technology has evolved in the interplay of weapon and armor, measure and countermeasure, in lockstep with scientific progress throughout history. As our understanding of physical processes probes more deeply and technology grows more complex, the sophistication of weaponry keeps pace. Today, maintaining an edge over adversaries relies on understanding subtleties of materials and forces that challenge the limits of experimental science. To meet this challenge, scientists turn to supercomputers. Using numerical simulation, they model processes intractable to physical experimentation. These virtual experiments are run repeatedly with closely controlled variations, accelerating the design cycle and dramatically lowering the cost. The Army High Performance Computing Research Center has been at the forefront of developing and refining methods of numerical simulation since 1989. It's a consortium of seven partners, Clark Atlanta, Florida A&M, Howard, and Jackson State Universities, the Universities of Minnesota and North Dakota, and Network Computing Services. They've built a system of talented scientists focused on Army problems using the most advanced computing resources on Earth. In September 2001, representatives from all the participating organizations gathered in Minneapolis having just won a long-term cooperative research contract with the Army. As they undertook planning future projects, N. Radhakrishnan, Director of Computational and Informational Sciences for the Army Research Laboratory, emphasized the critical nature of their work. The second part of it is that the Army has a very ambitious program called, which is called in general Army Transformation. They are coming out of the vehicles they call Future Combat Systems. Our tank now weighs 75 tons, and we are seeing it right now. How long does it take for us to mobilize? I just can't take all those dumb tanks and put them in Afghanistan, is that right? Because the planes are not big enough to do it. So the Army is under the program, essentially, to make lighter, faster, more survivable, more lethal tanks that only weigh 20 tons. How the hell are you going to do it? A significant part of the answer lies in refining the methods of numerical simulation and scaling them more effectively on larger systems. To accomplish this, the AHP-CRC has created and implemented a comprehensive program that includes the development of human and technical resources, a concentrated program of applied research, and a basic research program focused on Army technology issues. Key components of the educational programs are summer institutes in computational science and high-performance computing. Silicon carbide provides an increased material strength at, half, at about half the weight. These summer institutes meet for eight weeks each year with students from all the partner universities. The behavior of the movements appear in every part of the, the, the crystal and it starts to melt around 5,000 degree Kelvin. They teach the use of scalable computing to solve relevant scientific and engineering problems. My compounds were much more complex, which means much more machine time is required to optimize the geometry. These institutes play a pivotal role in identifying promising students for continuing programs, which start with research internships and go through graduate and postdoctoral fellowships. I'm here to speak about my program called Vorange, which stands for Volume Rendering Engine. The uh, HPCSC has had a tremendous uh, impact, you know, on the uh, on research and uh, educational uh, components at Jackson State uh, uh, University, and uh, we are glad to be a member of this, uh, uh, we call it alliance. My university has been a member of several consortia. And this really is the one that is gelling very well. It's beginning to truly develop into what, what, what all of us think 
is the way universities ought to be collaborating. It's more than just an academic exercise. There are other people who are counting on these results being produced. And that's uh, enormously important in the education of um, young engineers or uh, physical scientists. Clear testimony to the success of these programs is embodied in Andrew Johnson, who began as a graduate student just after the center's inception. He continued through postdoctoral work to his current position as senior scientist. People can come through here, learn how to use computers, learn about all these issues about numerical simulation, and go off either at the same center or the Army or other government agencies and use the computers effectively. Key to effective use of the world's fastest systems are tools that can realize their power. Tools for numerical simulation created at the AHPCRC are being used by many Army and DOD researchers. These include geometric modeling, automatic mesh generation, and most recently, an efficient new tool for visualizing the results of simulations. Presto is built on a client server model. It allows researchers across a network to run very large data sets on supercomputers, then visualize them on their workstations. And the first thing I'm going to do is make a connection between the client application here and the T3 connection, and it says connection established. So now the, this workstation and the T3E are talking to each other. Once the data set is loaded on the server, the user can request views depicting different variables, such as pressure on the parachute, ISO surfaces, velocity vectors, and update any view for each time step of the simulation. Presto can also be used to create animations. Most importantly, this is accomplished from any point in the network, making visualization far more accessible to Army researchers. They don't have to transfer the data from the location where it was computed, which could take hours, you know, hours or even a day. They can look at any data set size that they want, they just grab more processors, and yet they have the full functionality of a professional data visualizer, you know, on their desktop. Steve Ray has a long history with the center as well, beginning in the graduate fellowship program in 1990 to his position as staff scientist today. His work addresses one aspect of the future combat systems. We have to make the guns as light as possible, but still keep them as lethal as possible. Some aspects of gun firing cannot be observed experimentally. One of them is the motion of the propellant during the firing cycle. The pressure inside of a gun goes from atmospheric to as high as 5,000 atmospheres, maybe a little higher. And with pressures that high, these pieces of propellant are going to move around, probably will run into each other and into walls and break. The rate at which a solid propellant burns is a function of the surface area of the propellant. So if you have a piece of propellant breaking into a number of pieces, all of a sudden the surface area goes up and it burns much more quickly. Thus the pressure rises more quickly and the projectile's velocity is increased. Ray studies the area between the breech and barrel where propellant discs are packed tightly. Once the projectile moves down the barrel, the smallest discs here are small enough that they can fit into the barrel. But this next size up and then later this largest size they cannot fit into the barrel. And it's likely that they will move towards the barrel but strike the sloped surface here, which is called the chambrage. At that point, what happens to them? Do they fracture? If so, how much? How does that affect the firing cycle? Still in the early stages of his project, Ray is modeling the fluid flow and disk movement in the chambrage during the first 500 millionths of a second after ignition. I can look at individual pieces of propellant and how they will deform inside of a gun. Most of the codes out there just don't have that level of detail. To observe that detail, Ray studies snapshots of individual time steps from the simulation as the pressure rises and the discs begin to deform. There are going to be long-term benefits from my work. First, there will be a new modeling capability. Secondly, there's going to be more of a general understanding of what happens when pieces of propellant bounce off each other and bounce off walls. And that's going to benefit any type of solid propellant gun. Specifically to this work, I think researchers will be able to look at the geometry, change the geometry, so that when the disks break, they're going to break in a known way. Essential to this work 
is access to the most advanced computers. The center has long been a leader in scalable computing, from the thinking machine CM5, one of the earliest massively parallel machines, to the Cray T3E, currently one of the most powerful non-classified systems in the Department of Defense. With over 1,000 processors, one feature that stands out is unsurpassed utilization of this valuable resource. We've had 90% or greater utilization of our T3E ever since we turned it on three years ago, and I think that's the only system in the world that could probably give you that, that reliability, the usability out of it. The balance and fast network of the T3E enable far higher scalability than clusters of PCs. Typical, we see one, two, three percent communication costs in an entire simulation. Even when we did the one billion element simulation, you know, we, one billion elements does about, and we use a thousand, over a thousand processors of our T3 for that. So it's about a million elements per processor. And even that really, really large simulation, the communication cost that I measured there was about one and a half percent. So really, again, it's infinitesimal. It's really not a factor anymore on a system like, an uh, integrated system like the T3E. Okay, yeah, there you can see the little cracks, and then the damage forms, and it goes right through. Why don't you, can you do that again? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there. nice. Tim Holmquist and Gordon Johnson work on the other half of the measure-countermeasure equation. Armor for different vehicles is becoming increasingly sophisticated, and the projectiles are becoming very sophisticated, too. The ceramics are are very strong and relatively lightweight and make a great armor material. They demonstrated their models were consistent with experimental results. Then you can go on excursions and you start to look at different designs and, and things that you think might improve the performance but you're not sure. And it's very cost effective to do it numerically. One quality of ceramics stood out. Their strength is a function of, of pressure. With this in mind, they began to investigate an effect that had been observed experimentally when the ceramic is confined in a jacket of steel. What happens is the penetrator comes down and it hits the ceramic and it flows along the top surface. That's called dwell. And at some point in this particular case, it transitions from dwell to penetration. Though the effect had been observed, the cause remained obscure. Well, what the, the code was able to tell us, or the simulation, was that the material is flowing out, it hits that outer containment, and it pushes that out, and what happens is it reduces the pressure or confinement on the ceramic, which then again reduces the strength and ductility of the material. And because it's at a velocity very close to the penetration transition velocity, just a little change in pressure is enough to allow it to penetrate. They tried different configurations to take advantage of dwell, one simulation detached the top plate so material could flow out, but the top moved up and reduced the pressure, allowing even further penetration. A wider containment was more successful, extending the time the material could flow before hitting the walls, which reduced the degree of penetration. We'd like to understand how that ceramic is, is behaving during that situation so we can take advantage of that and hopefully increase that, uh, what we call the the dwell penetration transition velocity and move that up. And of course that would again make the armor uh, a better armor. What a person would really like to do would be to, to develop both the software and have the hardware available such that the engineer can just sit there and, and as he tries to develop something, uh, instead, of <clears throat> instead of putting together a test plan, et cetera, et cetera, he just, his test really becomes on the computer and to the extent that we can do that quickly and more accurately, then we really uh, get a lot of efficiencies. I'm surprised by the results of the computations almost every time. It's, it's, it's really interesting. That's a good question. Because I always, I always have a preconceived answer of what's going to happen. And invariably, I'm always wrong. And I've, I've always missed something with which the computation uh, brings out and focuses. And again, uh, uh, why the computations can be so helpful. By providing the finest in high-performance computing research, the center helps the Army reach its goals. There has been some good products that came out of this program. We showed how industry, universities, and uh, the government can work together. And that is really a model that we are now basing everything else on. I think when we have consortia like this, uh, you're pulling all the resources, you're pulling all the talent, uh, 
pulling all the t talent together. So I really do see this as a, an important element of what we have to do uh, in the next few years because it's going to be a very tough environment that uh, our decision makers, our leaders, simply need to depend upon capabilities like the ones we have in the HPCRC. The Army High Performance Computing Research Center is dedicated to training young scientists and engineers and providing the ideal environment for researchers in academia, industry, and the Army to work together to solve the critical challenges the Army faces in safeguarding the security of the United States.